Good adventures, everybody. I'm Melissa Bonzek, and welcome to episode 96 of Books Cubed, the show where I chat with authors you should be reading. It is Thursday, April 8th, 2021, and I got a great show for you this week. I haven't asked in a while what people are reading. I really love to hear what people are reading, so don't forget to drop down to the show notes and click on the comment link. It will take you over to the YouTube channel and let me know what you're reading. What am I reading? Thanks for asking. Let me grab this off my shelf here. I'm reading this really fun graphic novel from Allegiance called Nora's Saga. And there's three out and you can find them at Walmart. I was really surprised to see them. I was walking through getting laundry soap or something and walked past the book section and did a double take. And they have them on a stand at the end of the aisle. It's more toward, toward um, the back toward the TVs, toward that section, not the center aisle. And it's called Nora's Saga. The artwork is gorgeous and the story is fun. This girl gets transported back to the Vikings and has all these adventures. And her dad is still back in modern day Canada. We're going to get right to it. Have a listen and I will see you after. This is chapter one of How to Launch Your Lizard by Melissa Bonzak and read today by Melissa Bonzak. And you can find this on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, and Google Play. And I will have links in the show notes. So here we go. Sarah Sunshine was killing my buzz. I slid out of my seat in the back row and dropped onto the carpet without spilling a drop of the lovely Zacapa in my flask. Up on the stage, my brother's book agent was scanning the dark auditorium, searching for me. Someone at the party must have witnessed my getaway. Junie, are you in here? Like I was going to answer. I'd been successfully avoiding the woman for more than an hour. She held out her cell phone, trying to light up the couple hundred seats between me and her, and took a sip of champagne. Sunshine isn't her last name, of course. It's something with at least two syllables. Maybe. I just call her that because she's happy. All the time. It gives me the willies. Junie, it's Sarah, Dewey's book agent. I wanted to talk to you before lunch. All these years, and she still introduced herself every time I saw her like I never paid attention to things. I took another sip of Zacapa, screwed the cap back on my flask, turned to crawl toward the red neon exit sign on my left, and slammed my head into an armrest. I clamped a hand over my mouth and groaned into my palm. Junie, Sarah called, I have some things to discuss. Normally, she'd talk business with my twin brother, but at the moment, he was out of the area, far out of the area. Dewey is the star of Gone Herpin, the number one nature show in the world. I'm his personal assistant and handle his fan mail, schedule his appearances, and keep his hardcore fans, the doozers, in check. But all that changed a year ago. Some bigwig at the production company that owns my brother's show got together with some other big wig at NASA, and after what had to have been a few bottles of wine, decided it would be really cool if my brother did a series of shows that could be broadcast to the whole world at the same time, from space. And that's where he currently was, 240-ish miles above the Earth's surface on the International Space Station. Which is why we were all here today, celebrating. His first show was in four days. Are we playing hide and seek? Sarah sang out. I dug around in my hobo bag and exchanged the flask for my cell phone. Leaning over my purse to cover the screen brightness, I clicked on the text app. NASA had given me a guy to help with anything I needed. And right now, I needed an escape route. I tapped on messages. What was that guy's name? He texted me when I'd gotten to town. 
I started scrolling. Mom. Pizza Chalet. Lucille the dog catcher back home. Why was she texting? I didn't have a dog. My bank. The dentist. Jeez. I needed to take some time and clear all this. There he was. My NASA guy. I typed. Auditorium. Open the door on the left. Wait. His left or my left? There were doors on both ends of the room. I thought about it, erased on left, and continued typing. Closest to party. Act casual. I crawled to the end of the aisle. About 30 seconds later, the exit door opened. A bright shaft of light spilled in, and a tall, clean-cut white guy with dark hair and a trim beard filled the doorway. Hello? Sarah called out. You look lost, he said. We met at the party. I'm Sarah, Dewey's book agent. I'm looking for his sister, June. He nodded. I'm Charlie. That was his name. He stepped into the room, leaving an arm on the door, propping it open. I crawled behind his feet toward the hall. And freedom. June. Uh-oh. It was a statement. I kept going. June. This time it was more of a shout. I think she can see you, my NASA guy whispered. Didn't matter. I was already committed. Junie, are you sick? Blast. Out in the hall, I scrambled to my feet and turned to face the stage. The acoustics are dreadful in there, I said. I'm doing the Q&A Sunday, and I'll never hear anyone in the last... Oh, they'll have mics, Sarah interrupted. Do you have a minute? There's this thing I was hoping you'd... But it's Wednesday, and Sunday is going to be here before we know it. I threw up my arms in an I'm overwhelmed gesture. I'd better go talk to... I pointed to my right and then turned in the opposite direction and ran. I hit the first door I came to, fell out into the sunny afternoon, and slipped into a convenient mob of families taking the tour. The guide was holding up a space shuttle glued to a stick and walking backward. This is the Vernon Banks Auditorium. Starting this Sunday afternoon, Mr. Dewey Nash of the Nature Program Gon Herpin will be conducting the first session of his Universal Classroom, live from the International Space Station. There were oohs and ahs, and everyone stopped to take pictures of Sarah standing in the door I'd just escaped. I held my breath and ducked behind a bear-sized dad with a toddler on his shoulders. Wait, the guide whispered loudly. Nobody move. He pointed at the sidewalk, and everyone looked down. That is a brown anole, just like the ten anoles that Dewey took with him to space, where he will be seeing how the lizards react to a weightless environment. And everybody looked back up. So exciting, the guide whispered. No one said anything, because normal people weren't excited about lizards, even when they went to space. The guide gave the group a you don't deserve me look and pointed at a banner on the building. And then Sunday morning, of course, is our annual half and full marathon starting at 6 a.m. with both ending at the lighthouse. Don't forget, you can still sign up. There are plenty of bibs left. No one seemed interested in those either. Whatever a bib was, it must not have been very good. The tour guide let out a little why do I bother, sigh, and waved his space shuttle stick and went back to walking backwards. And we're walking. I hadn't driven to Kennedy Space Center. Parking sucked, so I dug my cell phone out of my purse. I was limited to who I could call. Dewey was in space. I was trying to get away from Sarah. Mom's plane didn't land until the weekend. My only option was Morgan, my brother's best friend and my former arch-nemesis. 
I knew he was coming up for Dewey's first show. I just wasn't sure if he was in town yet. I slipped into the crowd and dialed the phone. Morgan answered on the third ring. Are you in town yet? I whispered. I could hear someone in the background crying, probably because of something he'd said. The guy had a knack for getting people in trouble, usually me. June? The crying in the background stopped, and I heard a woman's voice ask, Is that your partner? Partner? I wasn't his... Oh, he must have been trying to break it off with some girl he picked up the night before. For a skinny guy with wiry brown hair, Morgan had left quite a trail of broken hearts over the years. I need a ride back to my hotel, I said, as I bumped into the back of the bear dad. He turned to look at me, and I gave him my best, I'm sorry for existing, smile. Where are you? Morgan asked. Kennedy, near the visitor's center. Sarah had given up and gone back inside, so I broke with the group and turned toward the parking lot. But I'll be waiting in the parking lot. Hurry, I said. Be right there. Before he hung up, the woman started crying again. Morgan's be right there turned into 20 minutes. I spent the time hiding behind a little cluster of trees just in case Sarah's sunshine made more of an effort to find me. She didn't. When I heard Morgan's Dodge Charger roar into the lot, I leaped out of my hiding spot and tucked myself into the front passenger seat before he'd even stopped. In a hurry? he asked. I yanked the seat belt into place and slid down till I was well below the window. Morgan's greyhound Cyrano leaned into the front from the back seat, and I gave her a quick scratch. Good to see you, too, he said. I twisted a bit to look over and up at him. You, too. And it kind of was. It had been about a year, but it could have been yesterday. Same wiry brown hair. Same I spend too much time outdoors tan. Same lopsided grin. He was a little overdressed for the Florida heat. Jeans and a button-down lemon-yellow shirt rolled up to his elbows. Maybe whatever he'd been doing all morning had involved being inside. Air conditioning here was just as bad as the heat. Dewey'll be stoked you're in town, I said. And he would be. They were best friends. Morgan shifted the charger into gear. I think your hair is caught in the door. It probably was, thanks to a chunk of Greek grafted onto my family tree, courtesy of the man my mother never liked to refer to as my father. My twin brother and I had wild, dark, crazy hair. Dewey kept his fairly short, and it looked great. I'd cut mine once. It had made the curls angry. Since then, I let it get to around the middle of my back. Usually, it was contained in a long ponytail. Today, I hadn't bothered, and I was paying the price. Five minutes into the ride, I realized we weren't headed to my hotel. Where are you going? Do you mind if we make a quick stop? And then he pulled over before I could answer. I'm looking into a missing person case. I freed my hair from the door and then twisted in my seat to look at him. Just past his head, I could see picnic tables, a soccer field, kids on swings, neglectful mothers occupied with cell phones. I didn't think you were really serious when you said you wanted to be a P.I. Almost a year ago, in Key West, we'd been involved in a case of mistaken identity. Morgan had come out of the excitement with the investigation bug and had stayed in Florida to pursue a license. I'd put the islands on my never-again list. This case is pretty basic, Morgan said. And before I could object, he ran down the details. Two sisters, both lived in town, both worked weird hours, both loved breakfast, and met at that corner cafe every morning. Morgan pointed up the street. At least until yesterday, Helen never showed. They live in the same town, but they have breakfast together every day. Some families like each other, I guess. 
I lived with my brother when he wasn't in space, and I still didn't see him every day, and I liked him. So your client's sister misses one meal, and she calls a P.I.? Two meals. She didn't show up this morning, either. Didn't you drive up from Key West yesterday? He nodded. How did you get a client so fast? Lucky. Right, I said. I'd bet my flask and its delicious contents that this client was some woman he'd met last night at a bar. Can't she call the cops? She did, he said. They didn't take her as seriously as I did. What are you going to do? Start by seeing if her sister is home. He held up a key. Why can't she do that? She did, but she can't keep coming over here. She has a job. What if one of the neighbors thinks you're a burglar? I asked. He grinned and dug his wallet out of a pocket and flipped it open. There in the little plastic window was an ID card proclaiming that the great state of Florida had found him to be competent enough to be awarded a license in the field of private investigation. Nice, I said, but you could have dropped me off first. This was on the way. It really wasn't. He reached behind me to scratch Cyrano. This shouldn't take long. The missing sister is probably at the mall, I said, and when she gets home and finds you in her house, she's going to shoot you. This is Florida. Just walk Cyrano around if she gets whiny, which is why he hadn't dropped me off. What about if I get whiny? Morgan gave me a cut-it-out-please look, got out, jogged across the street to an apartment building, and climbed the stairs to the second floor. He knocked on a door, waited, and then let himself in. I glanced back at the hound. Her bottom lip quivered, and she rooed at me. That hadn't taken long. He'll be back. I yawned, scanned channels on the radio, found an emergency stash of bees' bunts in the glove box, the little snack cake with the creamy sriracha kick. Score! I tossed a couple in my purse, thumbed through Morgan's inferior collection of CDs, and decided I'd had enough. How about some fresh air? I asked the hound. She rude. I found a scrunchie in my hobo bag, got my curls under control, and then shut off the engine and clipped the hound to her leash. Over at the park, the parents were packing up their kids. We'd have the place to ourselves. I dug one of the bunts out of my purse and turned left toward the swings. The hound jerked my arm to the right toward the apartments and took off at full speed. I stumbled out into the road, tripped, lost the little cake, and screamed as the front left tire of a boxy green car screeched to a halt, right on top of the sriracha-flavored cream-filled goodness. A bald white guy behind the wheel rolled down his window and started shrieking some sort of gibberish. Hey, I was the one with the dead snack cake. I stood up and did a quick doozer check. My brother's fans like to make up stories about me, so it was always good to make sure there weren't any around. The coast was clear, so I replied to the driver with both of my angry fingers. That shut him up. He hit the gas, got a few car lengths up the street, and slammed on the brakes. I watched the tires adjust, and the car zoomed back at me. I scrambled to get out of the way, tumbled over Cyrano, and clutched the hound as a bumper sticker stopped just shy of our noses. I blinked at the black letters on the plain white background. What do women and coins have in common? Rolls. Cyrano let out a little rue, and a drop of nose juice splashed on my arm. Me too, I whispered. The car idled a moment longer and then roared to top speed and screeched around a corner out of sight. I got us out of the street, took a moment to let my heartbeat return to normal, and headed for the same door that Morgan had used. It wasn't locked, so we went in. 
I stopped in the entryway to tear open another bee's bunce and gawk. The place was a typical starter apartment, narrow stand by the front door for hats and keys, living room to the right, couch, chair, coffee table facing a TV stand topped by a flat screen. Past that to the right, a small hall that probably led to the bedroom. And about ten paces in front of me, Morgan sat at a small breakfast table, his back to me, stacks of papers around him. To his right, I could see the edge of what I'd guessed was a galley kitchen. And it might have been nice if every inch of available space hadn't been covered in knickknacks. Some were space-themed, which made sense. Cape Canaveral was a space town. The rest of the stuff didn't make sense, though. On just a quick glance around the room, I saw a snow globe with an alligator at the beach, a die-cast green Mustang the size of my thumb, a harmonica, two ceramic sugar packet holders from the Greystone Diner, a Cupid doll wearing an I Heart Truckin' t-shirt, and a shot glass from the Keystone Bar and Grill. Dewey and I had eaten there the day before he'd been quarantined, before his trip to space. The hound smacked her muzzle against my leg, and her wet tongue worked its way around the bunt cake, liberating it from my fingers. I wiped my hand on my shorts and slipped her leash around the front doorknob. Morgan would kill me if she started drooling all over the place. At the table, I leaned over Morgan's shoulder. So what are you looking for? He squeaked and leaned back in his chair with a hand over his heart. Sorry, I said. What are you doing in here? Making sure the sister didn't shoot you? She's not home, I take it? No. What are you looking for? He bobbed his shoulders once. Whatever led to her disappearance? New Jimmy Choo's, I said. Maybe a coach purse. From the looks of the place, something from the corner gas station made more sense. He twisted in his seat to look up. I don't think she's at the mall. Then his eyes darted to either side of me. Or rather, my thighs. Is Cyrano in the car? Because I don't want her in here contaminating the scene. She's... I turned to point and stared at the empty front doorknob. Blast. In the car, yeah. You left the engine running, right? I gave him a noncommittal grunt and waved a finger at all the papers. What's all this? Court cases. The missing sister's a lawyer? He shook his head. She transcribes depositions, stuff from lawyers. Which was kind of interesting. You think some crook decided she knew too much and got rid of her? They probably would have started with the lawyer, or the judge, or the jury. If you're going to stay, sit. Morgan pointed toward the two bar stools at the tiny island in the tiny kitchen. Then he wagged a finger at me. But don't touch anything. Then he went back to the files, and I slinked away to look for the dog. The couch and sofa were empty. I tiptoed past to a bathroom, glanced in, no dog, did a double take and went in. There was a toilet seat nailed to the wall. I flipped on the light. The seat was about six inches wide and had a gold key dangling from it on a black chain, like something they'd give you at a gas station when you wanted to use the bathroom. The words Prattville 76 and ladies, no apostrophe, were written on it in black sharpie. Okay, the missing sister was weird. Who steals bathroom keys from gas stations? The bedroom was next. Sun streamed in from a window, lighting up walls filled with posters. Comic book related. Maybe. Over-the-top guys and gals in weird clothing. Probably superheroes. A long dresser was covered in jewelry stands. I'd never had a use for accessories. Jingly things just gave you away when you were trying to hide from doozers. But the missing sister was quite the fan. Bangles of every imaginable color. Braided silver chains. Things with feathers and beads and shells. She had almost a dozen lockets and three bracelets with three different names. Jean, Emily, Phoebe. Huh. 
Maybe she had kids. After checking out a selection of rings on three hand-shaped stands, I turned toward the bed and sighed. There was the hound, sprawled out on the quilt, shoulders deep in an orange gym bag. Hey, I whispered. Cyrano lifted her head out of the bag. A little tan stuffed animal dangled from the sides of her mouth. So much for keeping things contamination free. You are so dead, I whispered. She spit out the toy and started poking it with her nose. Come here, I hissed. The hound ignored me, of course. I snatched the toy before she could scoop it back into her mouth. It was a little kangaroo. She hadn't torn it, although I could see that it had been mended at least once before. Its pouch was sewn shut with bright red thread. The hound had covered it in slobber, which seemed pretty contaminated to me. Morgan was not going to be happy. I snatched it away and dropped it into my purse and wiped my wet fingers on my shorts. Hopefully, the sister wouldn't miss it. Cyrano let out a pathetic little roo and tried to flip my purse open with her long nose. Stop it. I shifted my bag to the other shoulder. Don't think I won't tell your daddy how bad you've been. There was a creak behind me. I turned away from the delinquent hound as the closet door swung wide, and a ninja leaped out. And that's it for now. Go ahead and leave any comments if you'd like to tell me what you thought of the book or if you have a book you want to recommend. Just uh, like I said before, just go down to the show notes and click on comment. I know what the word is. Click on comment and it will take you over to our YouTube channel and you can comment there. Everybody knows how to use YouTube, right? Right? <laughs> I think they do. And that's it for now. I will see you next week with another great show. Go read a good book. <laughs>